All right, guys, this is lecture four. I wanted to start off this one by sharing a spiritual story. So when I was a kid, probably seven or eight years old, we lived in central California in the middle of a grape vineyard. And one night, a tornado cloud drifted over our house. And the news channels were expecting tornadoes to hit the ground and cause some devastation. And one of them was parked right above our house and a funnel started actually coming down towards our house. My family, we were pretty scared and nervous. We were trying to decide if we should drive away or all go hide in the cellar. My mom was telling us that we probably wouldn't have enough time because the tornado was coming down. So I ran to my room really quickly and I said a prayer and asked Heavenly Father, no, please don't let this tornado come down and hit us and kill us all. And so as I prayed, I felt a prompting from the Spirit telling me that, that the tornado wouldn't come down and we'd all be fine. And after that, I felt perfectly confident that we would be fine. And I went out and I told my mom that I had prayed about it. Heavenly Father told me the tornado wasn't going to hit us. And she just kind of played off. She didn't really uh, seem to even notice. You know, she was kind of stressed out about a tornado and she wasn't too worried about uh, what a little seven-year-old was thinking at the time. But uh, the funnel just stopped coming down and just kind of froze in place. And the tornado cloud drifted off and you know, the funnel never touched the ground anywhere. So I'm sharing that with you just because uh, I like to share spiritual experiences with my students uh, and just, you know, promote faith. And part of why I share that story specifically is because you're going to start praying pretty hard pretty quick because we're going to start talking about statistics and the nightmare that they will be for you in your life. I'm sorry that they will be so hard, but you still got to learn them because they're good for you. It's like taking your vitamins, except now you can make gummy vitamins, but we don't have gummy statistics. All right, but let's talk first about how statistics fit into science. So in, a, in science, we start with a question or hypothesis, and then we develop some sort of experiment to test that hypothesis. And from that experiment, we collect data. And with that data, we then have to decide what to do with it. And oftentimes, we will apply different statistical analysis to or analyses to that data and decide if we have a complete picture yet. And if we don't, we'll keep collecting more data and doing more experiments and so forth until finally we feel like we have a good result that we can publish and put out in the world. So let me show you a real experiment and talk about how statistics were applied to it. So in the 80s, the late 80s, there was a team that was trying to figure out how muscles are triggered, so how your body makes your arm flex. So just really quickly, the way this works is little neurotransmitters are sent out and these interact with gates that line your muscle cells. And these neurotransmitters cause the gates in your muscle cells to open. And that causes ions to flow into your muscle cells. And this causes a change in the osmotic, osmotic pressure that causes your muscle to contract. Okay. Um, but how was this actually measured, this flow of ions? And what did it actually mean? in terms of what was going on. Well, the thing that they measured was the current of the ions, or the flow of the charge of the ions from one side of the muscle tissue to the other. So they had really tiny probes, and they stuck one on this side of the muscle cell and one outside the muscle cell, and they literally just measured the change in, or the current as ions flowed into here, which is pretty cool. Here is what their data actually looks like. On the x-axis down here, I have the current that they measured. So they're measuring in picoamps, which is pretty small, um, which is to be expected if you're measuring single cells. But down here on the x-axis is the current, and on the y-axis is the number of observations. So this type of plot is what we refer to as a histogram. And so what that means is if you look at this, it's got a bunch of blue or green squares, depending on how colorblind you are. I'm actually a little colorblind. My wife and daughters make fun of me for that, but 
I don't think there's as many colors as they claim, they claim there are. Anyways, if you look at this, between 2.6 and 2.62, we have one big box. And what that means is if the um, scientists measured a value of 2.61 or 2.605, they would throw it into this bin. And then they count up how many things are in that bin, and that's what gets plotted here. And then you see this black line here. This black line is what we call a Gaussian fit. So a Gaussian equation looks like this, if you cared to know, uh, where we have several letters. So first we have A, which tells us how tall our Gaussian is going to be, and that's times the natural E raised to the negative of x, which is just where we are on the x-axis, minus b. And this b term tells us where on the x-axis our peak is going to hit. And then this c that tells us the width of the peak. Now, you don't actually have to know the form of this equation. When I need this equation, I generally just Google it and find it on Wikipedia. Um, but what we do is we optimize this a, b, and c term so that our Gaussian gives us what we call the best fit to this data. You'll notice it's not a perfect fit. For example, the peak here doesn't quite match the peak of our histogram. But there are some things to remember. First off, this is a histogram, so it's not a continuous set of data. But we try and match this Gaussian to the center of all these peaks. And there's nothing really saying that this data has to be a Gaussian, but modeling it with a Gaussian uh, makes it easy for us to get useful information out of this, specifically numbers that we can use in statistics. So what all do we get from the Gaussian? Well, from the very center of it, from the top of this, we get what we call the average, right? And in statistics, we actually call the average X bar. So that's just an X with a line over it. So I've got it shown here on the graph and I've got it shown up here on the plot or sorry, on the PowerPoint. So this is an X with an I, a line over it, and this is what we call the sample mean or average, sample average. And if you look right here on the PowerPoint, there's also this little green line denoting the width of this Gaussian. And so the width of this Gaussian is described with what's called the standard deviation. Which you'll notice that this standard deviation is pretty high up on this Gaussian, right? It's probably two-thirds of the way up. Um, it's not measuring the width that, say right here, pretty close to the bottom or even the width at the very bottom. Now we can't measure the actual width at the bottom because this Gaussian equation technically goes on forever in either direction, so that wouldn't be very useful. And so st statisticians came up with this standard deviation uh, value, and what this actually means is that within one standard deviation, so that means plus or minus one standard deviation of the average, that you're actually going to encompass about 68.3% of all of your measurements. And then within two standard deviations, that's a width of probably, I don't know, probably about there. Then within two standard deviations of the average, 95.5% of your measurements are contained. And within three standard deviations, about 99.7% of your standard deviation is contained. So the X bar and S values are very useful to us. We use them all the time in statistics and in analytical chemistry. We'll also introduce you to another term called the variance. So variance isn't used a ton in analytical chemistry, but it's used a lot in biochemistry and in biology. So the bio people really like it. Um, so the variance is just equal to the square of the standard deviation. Okay, we're not going to use that a ton, but some of you will probably use it in the future in other classes or in research, so it's important for you to know about it. Um, but let's talk then about uh, applying a Gaussian to data and when it's appropriate. We're going to start by looking at some final exam completion times for Chem 106. So these were collected in the winter semester of 2010 um, with 489 students. And describing this data as a Gaussian, we can find that the average time to complete the exam was 2.5 hours, and the standard deviation of that time was 0 0.9 hours. 
So let's look at the actual data. We'll look at a histogram of the data. And this is what it looks like. You'll notice that the data looks fairly like a mountain. We have an average time of about two and a half hours. It's right here. It's pretty close to the peak. So this peak rises a little more smooth, smoothly on the left and a little more jagged fall on the right. And so that makes our peak a little to the left of the of what you might choose as the peak of this mountain, but it's pretty close. And we have a standard deviation of about 0.9 hours, which gives us some meaningful data uh, about the final exam completion time. So it would be okay to describe this data with a Gaussian fit. Now let's look at some other data. Let's look at the overall grades, uh, and, and we'll be displaying these in terms of GPA for the same students in the same semester. So the average GPA was actually a 2.5 for that semester, which matches really close with the average of the number of hours taken to complete the final exam. And those two numbers being related is what we call nonsense because there is actually no real correlation between them, just a coincidence. Anyways, the average was a 2.5, which is between a C plus and a B minus, and the standard deviation was a 1.1. So let's look at the actual data and see if these numbers of the average and standard deviation actually tell us something meaningful. Uh, well, if I look at this data, it doesn't look very mountainous. So a Gaussian kind of looks like a mountain. This looks like maybe a mountain range, several mountains. So if we say the average is right here and we're within plus one or minus one of that, it doesn't really portray this data quite as well as it did for the final exam completion time. So recording an average and standard deviation for the grade distribution gives you some information, but it's really not as meaningful because the data doesn't look quite right. Okay, so it's important to kind of understand what people's data look like and understand whether they're applying statistics to it correctly. Now we're going to give an example of some real world data and figure out how to actually calculate our X bar and our S for the data. We're gonna do that using a game called Uno Attack. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever played Uno Attack, but in Uno Attack, you press this little button on the Uno Attack engine. I don't know what that is, the machine. Press the button and it shoots some cards at you sometimes and sometimes you don't get any. So the button was pressed until cards came out four different times and we counted the number of cards that came out each time. So the first time the button was pressed, three cards came out. The second time, four cards came out. The third time, five cards came out. And the fourth time, four cards came out. Okay, so now we have a data set right here. We have the number of cards that come out each time we pressed it. So let's calculate the X bar and S of all these cards being ejected, okay? So the way we're going to do that is by using these two equations. So these equations, they look a little tricky. So for X bar, what you do is you have to sum up all the values of X. That's what this notation means if for those of you that haven't gotten this far in math yet. We're gonna sum up over all of the X values. That's what this I means. And so we're going to add the first X value, the second, the third, et cetera. And then we're going to divide by the number of measurements we took. That's a really complicated way of saying you're gonna be calculating X bar the same way you've been calculating the average your entire life. Okay. Now for the standard deviation, this guy gets a little trickier. And here it becomes really important to understand what all the notation means. So I'm going to start with this equation right here, or this part of the equation right here. So what we're going to do is sum up all of the x values minus the average x value squared, right? So let's throw the data up on here and I'll tell you what I'm actually meaning. So xi is, for x1, it's going to be 3, x2 is going to be 4, x3 is going to be 5, and x4 is going to be 4. And this average, this X bar, is just going to be the average of all these numbers. Now the average of all these happens to be four. And so this is going to be three minus four uh, up here. So three minus four will be negative one. And then we have to square that. So negative one squared will be one. Four minus four will be zero. 
5 minus 4 will be 1, and we'll square that and get a 1. And 4 minus 4 is 0 again. So we have 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0. So this whole part of this equation is going to equal 2. Then we're going to divide that by n minus 1, where n is the number of trials we had. So we had four trials. We'll subtract 1. So this would be 2 divided by 3, and then we take the square root. So our standard deviation in this case is going to be the square root of 2 thirds. And so our average will be 4. Our standard deviation will be 0 0.8. All right, now I'm going to give you your own numbers. I want you to pause the video, work through these numbers, see if you can get the right average and standard deviation. OK, here's here are the numbers I got for this. For an average, I got 6.25. And for my standard deviation, I got 0 0.957. OK, so what do we do with this standard deviation? We said last time that you need to round this to one or two significant figures. So let's go ahead and do that. If we round it all to one significant figure, then it actually turns into a one. And if we do two significant figures, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the way you need to round it for this class because we're reporting everything with one standard deviation. All right, since this has no decimal places, that means this has to be rounded until it has no decimal places as well. So our average is going to be six plus or minus one Uno cards coming out of here. Now these two guys right here are both rounded, so we have two significant figures. Um, we can round this so that it becomes 1.0 or we can round it so it's 0 0.96. Which of these two would be better if we were actually keeping two sig figs? Well, the 0 0.96 is more descriptive than the 1.0, so, well, and if you rounded to 1.0, you'd lose more sig figs, so why lose sig figs if you don't have to? Uh, but of course, in this class, again, we're only going with the one sig fig, all right? So hopefully you solved that by hand or using a calculator. Now let me actually show you how you're going to be doing this for the rest of the semester, okay? So the way you're going to be doing this the rest of the semester, and hopefully for the rest of your life, is with Excel. So Excel is a program that has lots of built-in functionality to let you do things. So you'll notice here I've typed in the number of trials we have, I typed in the number of cards that I got for each one. And now let me show you how to calculate the average here. So what I'm going to do is type equal, and I'm going to type average. I'm going to put a parentheses right there, and I'm going to just come over and click on the data. I'm going to hold the mouse down the whole time. If you hold the mouse down, it'll let you move this big square around. I'm going to select all the data I want, and then I'm going to close the parentheses, and hit enter. So now you'll see we got an average of 4.0 there. And for the standard deviation, we don't actually type standard deviation, we type STDEV, which is just short for standard deviation. And again, we highlight these numbers. We, oh no, I forgot to close the parentheses. That's okay, most of the time it can figure out how to close them for you. So these are the numbers I got for my average and standard deviation. Let me type in the numbers that you were supposed to use. So we'll change this to six, five, seven, and seven. So I got 6.310. Let's see if I change the number of decimal places. So how I did that is I selected both of these cells and there's these buttons right up here that'll let you change the number of decimal places for both of them at the same time. So let's change that to just be one sig fig in the standard deviation and that looks great. All right, so that is going to be how you calculate your averages and standard deviations going forward. All right, now another value that you're gonna to need to know how to calculate is your relative standard deviation. So your relative standard deviation or percent standard deviation or percent relative standard deviation is just another form of percent uncertainty. So this is a way of calculating relative uncertainty. And the way you do this is you just take the standard deviation divided by the average times 100%. So let me ask you this question really fast. How many sig figs should the relative standard deviation have? Okay, well, 
we're dividing the standard deviation up here, and the standard deviation should always have one sig fig. So according to our multiplication division rules, our percent relative standard deviation should always have the same number of significant figures as our standard deviation, which should always be one. So your standard deviation and percent relative standard deviation should always have one sig fig. I know I've said that a lot, but I'm gonna say it probably a few more times because some of you will undoubtedly forget, okay? Which isn't a problem, and if you do forget, feel free to reach out and ask me, but um, I'm gonna say it a lot because it's something people struggle with a lot in this class. Okay, now so far, we've been dealing with a sample of the data. We've been dealing with a sample of what the UNO attack game can do. So the sample is just looking at a small sample or a small set of the possible outcomes. But what we really wanna know about is the population here. So the population are the results representing all possible outcomes. So we wanna really understand how this UNO attack game is coming out. Now the relationship between the sample and the population looks like this. So what this notation means is that as the number of measurements we take approaches infinity, our sample average or our sample mean becomes our population mean. And we distinguish the population mean with a separate character from the sample mean so that we can quickly identify what we're actually writing. And the same thing goes for the uh, sample standard deviation. At the limit where the number of measurements we take approaches infinity, our sample standard deviation approaches our population standard deviation, which we signify with a sigma, which is the Greek form of the letter S. Now usually for a population mean, we generally um, don't take actually an, um, an infinite number of uh, trials or an infinite number of measurements, but usually between 1,000 and 10,000 measurements is sufficient for everyone to accept that you have the population statistics for the uh, sample that you're looking at. Now for most measurements though, let's say you are uh, doing experiments on mice uh, each mouse costs a certain amount to raise and to sacrifice and so forth. Um, and so you can't usually do 10,000 mouse experiments for every paper that you write. And so usually you have some sort of limiting factor based on practical limitations of your um, experiment, whether that's time, whether that's money, whether that's instrumentation, or if you just have a precious sample that's going to run out really quickly. You just can't do that many samples. So then what we want to know is how do our population, uh, how do our population statistics relate to our sample statistics? And so we're gonna ask, uh, is the X bar or this average that we got for four measurements close to the population average? The first thing we have to figure out is how confident do we wanna be? So we're basically asking, if I just take a few numbers, do I get the statistics that, that describe the whole thing? And the answer is never an absolute answer. So we have to say with what level of confidence we're getting our answer. The way that the population average relates to the sample average is through this equation that I'm showing you right here, where we have mu equal to x bar plus or minus a t value, which I'll introduce in a second, times our standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of measurements we took. So let's talk about this t and what it is. So this t was actually developed by a guy named William Seeley Gossett. He was a chemist working for Guinness Brewing Company in Dublin, Ireland in the early 1900s. And so back then, uh, the Guinness Brewery didn't let their scientists publish uh, their findings, they kept them as trade secrets that they used internally to improve their products. Um, but this guy, uh, William Gossett, felt like his uh, findings or his statistics were important to the world, so he published them under the pseudonym of student, and so this has become known as the student's T. The way this works is that we find which degree of confidence we want, 
So in this class, and for most things, it's just gonna be a 95% confidence, which means that we're 95% sure that our population uh, mean is going to be within the boundaries that we find. But So we go to 95%, and then we go down this axis to find the number of degrees of freedom we have. But what are degrees of freedom? So degrees of freedom are calculated by taking the number of measurements we made minus the number of sample sets. So if we're just looking at the data where we got an average of four, well in that sample set we had four measurements, so that would be four minus one, so we'd have three degrees of freedom. If we're trying to throw in the second data set where we had six, five, seven, and seven cards thrown at us, we're throwing in that into the pile where we got an average of four, then we'd have eight total measurements and two sample sets, so that would be eight minus two, which would be six. So we're just going to deal though with the data set that got us an average of four. So that would be four minus one, which would give us three degrees of freedom. So we go on this three degrees of freedom line over to 95% confidence, and we find a value there. So going to a table is one way of doing that. Another way is by using Excel, and if you learn to use Excel, this will help you sometimes. Sometimes you will just have to look at the table for the student T. But let me show you how to calculate this really fast. So for this T inverse, or for this function, we're gonna type T inverse, those are the parentheses. Now it wants a probability. So for this, the probability is related to your confidence interval. So it's not gonna be 95 though. We don't wanna type in 95 for the probability. For a 95% probability, or confidence interval, we're actually going to type in a probability of 0 0.05. And it's totally okay if you just remember that. You don't have to necessarily understand the logic behind that. But 0 0.05 is the same as 5%, which is the opposite of 95%. Okay, then we're going to hit a comma here, and it's going to ask for our degrees of freedom. We just figured out that we had three degrees of freedom, so we'll close that, and we get a T value of 3.182. I'm actually going to change these numbers real fast so they are similar to what we had before. I'll try and get it fixed today. Today? Uh, I'll try. We'll oh, see. Okay, yeah. I'll let you know when I get it back. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So let's compare that number to what we got on the t test. And we got a 3.182 on the t table, just like we did in Excel. So again, sometimes you're just gonna look that up, sometimes you can calculate it. It really just depends on the situation, which is more convenient. All right, so let's plug some numbers in here now. So we have our average of four, our T value equals 3.182, and our standard deviation equals 0 0.8. Let's plug those into this equation, and we get out an average of four plus or minus one. Now obviously this 3.82 times 0.8 divided by the square root of four doesn't actually equal one. I rounded it again to give myself one significant figure in the standard deviation. But what does this guy actually mean? What this means is that within 95% confidence, we can say that the population mean is somewhere between three and five. And 19 out of 20 times we will be right about that statement when we do these types of calculations. So this is with four trials. What happens then if we crank it up and do 68 trials? Well, then our confidence interval actually improves quite a bit. Now our population uh, average is equal to 4.9 plus or minus 0 0.4, which means that it's definitely not three. <laughs> All right, anyways, let's take this now so this is how you use uh, the t value to 
compare your sample and population averages. Now let's look at how we'll use the T values to compare data sets. So it's often important to figure out if two data sets are measuring the same thing or if they're measuring two different things. And so for an example, I'm gonna show you some data collected by Lord Riley or Lord Rayleigh. So Lord Rayleigh was a pretty prominent scientist back in his time, did a lot of things. Thing that's most relevant to my work that he did is he figured out how much charge you can put on a water droplet before it explodes. But anyways, he wanted to figure out how dense nitrogen gas was. And so he generated nitrogen and collected it into some big glass cylinders or big glass spheres is actually what they were. He wanted to be really confident in his measurements, so he got the nitrogen from two different ways. The first way was he took air and he passed the air through a pumping mechanism that separated out CO2, O2, and water. And so he thought that would give him pure nitrogen. And the second way that he did it was he heated N2O and NH4 and NO3, so those are separate. And each of these were known to give off nitrogen when heated, and he figured he could get some pure nitrogen that way. And so he collected nitrogen from both of these mechanisms, and he measured the mass of these glass spheres they were in, and this is what he got. So what I've got here is a number line with the mass in grams on the x-axis, and way over here, I have the nitrogen mass in these glass um, spheres collected from air. And over here, I have the nitrogen generated from the chemical reaction. And so what you can see is from air, we get a mass of about 2.31. And from the chemical reactions, we get a mass of about 2.30. So what's going on here? Are we getting some sort of impurity in one of these? Are we not generating nitrogen gas from the chemical reaction? Are these numbers really just close together and statistically they just happen to kind of separate like this due to random errors associated with the experiment? This is what we need to figure out. And this is what we're gonna apply statistics to to see if this population is the same or different as this population. So here are some actual numbers that he measured. So here are the masses that he got for the chemically generated nitrogen. And here are some masses that you got from the uh, nitrogen from the air. So the first thing we're going to want to do in comparing these data sets is calculate the average, the standard deviation, and count the number of measurements. And you'll notice in these guys, I'm keeping some extra sig figs because we don't want to round things off until the end of our test. Okay, once we have these numbers, the next thing we're going to do is actually compare these standard deviations and see how similar they are. The reason we're gonna do this is because the t-test that we're going to be used, or gonna be using, was derived using certain assumptions. And so there's actually two t-tests, one that was made with the assumption that these standard deviations are relatively close to each other, and the second was derived assuming these two were relatively far apart. So the way we actually test to see whether they're relatively similar or different is by what's called the F-test. So in the F-test, what we do is we calculate a value and compare that to a value on a table, similar to the T-test. So what we do is calculate an F-value, and that's going to be equal to the standard deviation from one sample squared divided by the standard deviation from a second sample, or a second set squared. And in the F-test, the first standard deviation always needs to be the biggest one. So S1 always has to be bigger than S2. And as a result of doing that, your F value is always going to be greater than one. Okay, so here are our X values, or our X bar values, or our S values. So which of these will go on top? Well, the 0 0.00137 is bigger than the 0 0.0014 value. So this one will go on top. Then what we do after we've calculated that value is we compare it to a value from a table. And in this table, what we have on the top is our degrees of freedom for our first set of data. 
And then on the y-axis here, we have the degrees of freedom for our second set of data. And again, our degrees of freedom is just the number of measurements minus the number of sample sets. So in this case, if we had eight measurements for our first sample set, we would only consider our first sample set in calculating our degrees of freedom. So we would have eight minus one degrees of freedom, which would be seven. And then you just come here and then you, for the second set, we had seven measurements minus one. So it'd be six degrees of freedom and we just go find that point on the table. Now again, you're not going to usually actually be doing this in, by looking at an F-test table. So let me show you how to calculate both these values in Excel. So first I'll show you how to look up the F table value. So we're gonna use this function called F inverse. So you just type in equals F I N V, close parentheses. Again, it's gonna ask for a probability. Uh, we're still gonna be working with a 95% confidence interval. So we'll still use 0 0.05 for the probability. Now for degrees of freedom, well, this guy has eight, uh, eight measurements. So we could type in seven or we could just click on that guy, minus one. And this function is fine with you doing some math inside of it. And we'll put another parentheses, or I'm sorry, another comma here. And then this will ask for our second degrees of freedom. And that'll be this number, minus one. I'll hit enter. And again, we get 4.21, just like we got from the table. And of course we need to calculate our F value for our actual measurements. So for that, we're going to take our first standard deviation. And the reason this box is moving like this is because of instead of me just clicking on it up here this time, I was using my arrow keys just to move it around, which you can do in Excel. So I, I choose that standard deviation, I square it. So I use that little caret symbol right here square it and that is just found above the six on your keyboard so you just hit shift six and we're going to divide that by our second standard deviation we're going to square that guy as well so our experimental f value or our calculated f value is 95.8 that's a little bit bigger than four and what that means now is that our uh, two standard deviations are significantly different meaning that uh, we have to use what's called the alternate t-test. So this is what the standard t-test looks like, and this is what you use if your calculated f value is less than your table value. Our calculated value was way better, bigger than our table value, so technically we shouldn't use this equation, but I'm gonna show you how to use the standard t-test and the alternate t-test in these slides, even though that's incorrect for this data. So what you're going to do is calculate a T value here. And this T value, then you're going to compare to your T value on your table. So this T is equal to the average of the first set of measurements minus the average of the second set of measurements. And you'll notice these are in absolute value lines. So it actually doesn't matter which one goes first. We're just going to find the difference and then change it to a positive number if it's negative. You're going to divide by this s pooled value, which we'll talk in a minute, and then multiply by the square root of the number of measurements in the first sample set times the number of measurements in the second sample set, divided by n1 plus n2. Now, this is a great place for you to make a mistake in typing this into Excel. So when you're typing this into Excel, you do n1 times n2 divided by and a lot of people will just type N1 plus N2, but that's not right because it'll be N1 times N2 divided by parentheses N1 plus N2. If you don't put those parentheses in there, then you're going to just do N1 times N2 divided by N1, and then to that whole thing, you're going to add N2 over here, okay? Now this S pooled value looks like this. So it's the square root of your first standard deviation squared times the number of measurements in your first set minus one plus the second standard deviation squared times the number of measurements in your second set minus one divided by n1 plus n2 minus two. So there's a lot there. Unfortunately, Excel does not have a function for 
typing these in, so you just have to type them in as an equation, which you'll get used to as time goes on. And then what you do is if your calculated t value, the one you calculate right here, is less than the table value from that t table, then your data sets are from the same population, and statistically there's no difference between them. But if your calculated value is greater than your t-table value, then the data sets are from different populations and they're, we consider them statistically different or statistically significantly different. All right, so let's apply the t-test to our data. So this is the number of measurements average and standard deviation from Lord Rayleigh's uh, measurements. And you'll notice, again, we're still carrying extra sig figs here. We're not rounding till the very end. I'm just going to plug these values into my equation for the s-pool. So here is my first standard deviation squared, my n1 minus 1, and my second standard deviation squared, et cetera. And from all that, I get an s-pooled value of 0 0.00101. So I'm going to, again, then take that throw it into my equation for t. I'm gonna throw in my averages and find differences there. Uh, I'm gonna take the absolute value, et cetera, and find a value of 20.2 for t. But is this less than the table value or is it greater? Well, how many degrees of freedom do we have? We have seven measurements in the first set and eight measurements in the second, so that's 15. We have two data sets, so that's 15 minus two. We have 13 degrees of freedom. And at 95% confidence, our T value at 13 degrees of freedom is 2.160. So as you can see, our T value that we calculated is way bigger than this T value on our table. And since this guy is so much bigger, that means statistically our two populations, these two populations are statistically significantly different. Meaning that we believe they are are measuring two different things. All right, so this is how you do the standard t-tests. Now let's talk about the alternate t-test. This is the one you do if your calculated f value is bigger than your table f value. All right, so here's the standard one that we just used, and it's got lots of things going on in it. Here is the alternate t-test, and you'll notice it actually looks a lot simpler than the standard one where we're just taking the difference of the averages, the number of samples, the number of measurements in each sample set is only included in here once, as is the standard deviation for each of those. And so at first glance, the alternate t-test looks really simple. And the thing that makes the alternate t-test not so simple though, is this right here. The degrees of freedom are calculated a little different for this guy, it's calculated like this which if you look at it, it looks like a nightmare. But let's work through this and figure out uh, how this is gonna work. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is calculate our T value and figure out Right, so we'll calculate the t-value and see if it's different, but first let's start with our 95% confidence interval and figure out what our degrees of freedom are. That'll tell us how many, or what our t-value is supposed to be. All right, so I'm back over here on our Excel spreadsheet, and I've got the equation written out here. Um, and I could just try typing this whole thing in using just a bunch of parentheses in here, trying to keep everything straight. Um, but odds are, if I type a big equation like that in all at once, I'm going to make a mistake. So what I'm going to do instead is calculate little parts of this at a time. So if you'll see right here, we have the first standard deviation squared divided by the number of measurements. I'm going to just calculate that. So I'm going to click on this number for S1 here. I'm going to square it, and then I will divide it by the number of samples. And then for this second part, for calculating the second standard deviation squared by the number of samples, I'm going to actually do a little trick here. If you look right in here, there's a little tiny square 
in the corner of this bigger square. If you hover over it, your mouse will turn black, or if you're using a Mac, it'll do something else, I don't know. But if you grab that and pull it to the right, what that does is it copies this function, but it changes which cells it's looking at. So if you click on this guy and click on the big white text box, or I guess yours is actually going to look smaller like this. But if you click into that, you'll see it's looking at J3 here, so J3, and at J5. And if I grab it and drag it over, I click on this one, then it's now looking at K3 and K5. So by dragging it to the right, it fills this right cell and it causes every cell it's looking at to move to the right too. So if I grab it and drag it down, it's going to give me an error. And the reason is because now it's looking at a text box and so I'm trying to square some text, which is nonsensical, and divide it by an empty box, which is zero. So I'm trying to take the square, root, the square of a word and divide it by zero. So it doesn't like that. But once you get a hold of, or a handle on how do you drag equations from place to place, it'll make all of this go a lot more quickly. Okay, next I'm going to calculate this stuff down here in the denominator. I'm going to start with this S1 squared over N1 and square all that divided by N1. Okay, so I'm going to have to put some parentheses here. I'll do S1 squared divided by N, close these parentheses, and if you look outside of the parentheses in the equation, there's a square up there. So I'm going to have to square this whole thing, and then I'm going to have to divide by N, and then I'm going to have to add one to it. All right, now I did something wrong in there, and I turned the whole thing into a one. You know what I did wrong? The thing that I did wrong is that right here, I divided by n1 plus 1, but I didn't put it in parentheses. So what I actually did was just divided by n1 and then added 1 to whatever this whole thing equals. Okay, so I'm going to change that. I'm going to put parentheses in there. And now it looks much different. So this is the correct number. I'm going to drag it over. And now I've calculated this whole part too. Now I'm going to put these two top numbers together in what's going on in the numerator up here. And you'll notice in the numerator that you add them together and then you square it. So I'm going to type equal, or parentheses, this value plus this value. And then I'm going to square it. So then I have the numerator. And then I'm going to figure out the denominator. And for this part, I calculated this whole big thing. All I have to do is add it to that one, so I can hit this plus this. Okay. And if you're trying to add a lot of numbers, something you can do is you can type, type equal sum, and then you can highlight all the values you want. If you highlight an empty value, it will not count it. But if you include one with a zero on it, it will include it. So if you sum up over a blank cell, it won't bother looking at it. All right, now we've got the numerator, we've got the denominator. Let's divide the one by the other. And then in this equation too, we have to just subtract two over there. And so we get a degrees of freedom of 7.2146 yada yada. So for the degrees of freedom, it actually has to be a whole number. So what we're gonna do is just round that to the nearest whole number. And I'm actually just gonna change the number of decimal points that are shown and just change it to seven. All right, so let's jump back over to our PowerPoint now. So at 95% confidence, our T value, our degrees of freedom should be seven. If we look at the T table, that'll give us a T value of 1.890. So now let's plug these values into our alternate T test. And that's gonna look like this. And we're gonna get a value of 21.7. So again, this T value is a lot higher than the table value. And if we compare this alternate t-test value that we got to the t-test value we got with the standard test, we'll notice they're not super different and the table t values aren't super different either. And so in this case, it wouldn't have mattered which test we used, but in a case where the calculated t-value is really close to the t-value, then it's really gonna matter which one you use.
All right. Now, all of this comes back to the point that we were trying to analyze some nitrogen gas for Lord Rayleigh. He's a lord and he just sits on his butt. So let's look at uh, his results. So he made nitrogen from air and from decombustion of some other compounds. And it appeared the nitrogen from air was slightly denser than the nitrogen from decomposition. So that means that at least one of them must be impure. Either the one from the air has some heavier gas in it or the nitrogen from the decomposition has some lighter gas in it. Uh, so what kind of error is this when we put this all together? Well, this is a systematic error because there was a problem with the system. There was an impurity in one of the samples. And in this experiment, actually, this is where Lord Rayleigh actually discovered argon, discovered that it, was, it, it existed in trace amounts in air, and that got him the Nobel Prize in 1904. Now, when will you be applying the t-test? Well, in experiment two, you're actually going to be using both forms of the t-test, and you're going to be using them a few times. All right, so if you have any questions about the lecture, feel free to reach out. I have gotten emails from a couple of you with questions, and I am happy to reply to those as I get them.